Um, hello, everyone. My name is Pastor Leslie Rogers, and I am the pastor of Children's Church. That includes grades first through eighth grade. I am so excited to be here today because a part of our ministry is ministering to the entire family. Uh, so every Sunday, um, I get to minister to your child, but also we want to provide resources for parents, for grandparents, uh, for aunts, uncles. If you have influence or if you care for another child, we want to provide resources for that. And so this is the first episode of Crucial Conversations. And the reason why it's entitled that is because I believe Jesus had a lot of important conversations. He discipled people through conversations. And in our society today, uh, we have to have conversations um, to care for one another well and to push um, the kingdom of God, even in our house. Um, so we should be Christians after we leave the church. And so today's first episode is about kids and the internet. And um, you know that topic is loaded, but we'll be covering more hot topics such as how to discuss faith with your child, um, how to discuss sexuality. There's so many different things um, that we can discuss. And I believe that God will use bits and pieces of these conversations to minister to you and your family as well. Before I keep talking, I want to introduce Dr. Kenya Grooms. So Dr. Kenya Grooms is a member of Salem Baptist Church, and she has a long resume. And so I'm going to let her uh, tell you about her resume, and we're going to continue the conversation. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I, I guess a really important part of my resume is that I came to Salem as a teenager when I was 15 years old. I didn't know that. And uh, one of the things that drew me to the church was the segment in the church when we hug our visitors. Mm. And I remember being a 15-year-old kid thinking, if a church could love on me like this and they don't even know me, yeah. imagine what could happen at that church. So I came to Salem many moons ago <laughs> as a 15-year-old. <laughs> but since then, um, I've graduated from college a few times. <laughs> I'm uh, trained as a clinical psychologist, and I've worked primarily with as a clinician with kids um, under 18 and of course working with children, you end up working with their families. So I have about 12 years of clinical experience with children and their families. So I've dealt with a wealth of issues pertaining to kids not fitting in, kids getting in trouble at school. Um, some of the work I did prevented um, first-time offenders from going into the correctional facility instead of giving them a sentence for juvenile detention, we would um, offer them a certain amount of sessions of therapy to kind of get wow. to the core of the issues yeah. that they were dealing with. So yeah. somewhere in that career path, um, my pastor asked me to come work at the church. I worked at the church. They overlapped for a number of years, and then um, I transitioned to academia and worked. I work at DePaul University as a um, part-time professor now. I was there for 10 years as a full-time teacher, and, and now I work as an academic dean at a junior college where I feel like it's the best of all my worlds combined. My students mm -hmm. are young. They started 18. Mm -hmm. um, they're predominantly African-American. I believe 40% of our population is African-American, and then the diversity is mixed after that. So I, I get to sort of use all of my various skill sets to work with families, um, and I love it. I love it a lot. Um, uh, this topic about the internet is an interesting topic. Um, we, in my family, I have a nine-year-old daughter now. She just made nine in February, and yes, we have Kennedy. had, yes, Kennedy. <laughs> Um, our heart, um, but we, we've had re really difficult conversations. We've had mm -hmm. really difficult conversations mm -hmm. with Kennedy, the internet, um, yeah. screen time, and I'm anxious uh, about having this conversation about to share some of those topics, to share some things that have come up in those topics, and talk about the internet and how it impacts kids today. Yes, well, I told you all, her resume is phenomenal. I couldn't begin to uh, <laughs> explain it. Um, and Kennedy goes to Children's Church, so she just does. want to give a plug, she goes there. Um, and just one quick thing, she counted down the days <laughs> to when Pastor Leslie took over. There were two Sundays and she said, 
is Pastor Leslie going to be children's pastor today? And I'm like, no, you have one more Sunday. <laughs> I love Kennedy. <laughs> Uh, part of this is, you know, when I was a child, and even when you were a child, our parents, they had to worry when we went out, right? If we were going to another friend's house, if we were um, hanging out, a sleepover. But now, as parents, you have to worry about your child can be in your house, but when they're on the internet, you just have no idea where they could be. And so now we're talking about a virtual space. And while the internet presents so many things, I mean, as a student, the internet was my best friend <laughs> for research. Uh, we have the world at our fingertips. But a part of the world, it does present some dangers and some challenges. And so I believe that as we have this conversation, um, our goal and our desire is that this will make you more aware and equipped um, as your child is uh, on the phone, on the computer, um, and the access that they have. And so how uh, Dr. Kenya Groves appeared here was I, was I was talking to my mom about this vision. And I was like, I, wanna, I want the first conversation to be about the internet and the kids. And my mom said, well, Kenya was on the news for this. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, what? And so I saw the clip. And so can you explain, uh, Dr. Grills was on the, uh, I forget what channel. Channel you were, 7. Channel 7, yes. And you were talking about uh, this very thing. And so can you explain all of that, that story? Sure. Um, I got to uh, this new segment because um, the segment was about an app called Musical.ly. Okay. And it's an app where I think it's sort of equivalent to Facebook for older people, okay. Instagram for the millennials, okay. and Musical.ly is sort of for kids, little kids. And I, um, so my daughter, I didn't know that she was using Musical.ly. And one of her friend's mom called me and said, um, you have to look at uh, Kennedy's Musical.ly account. And I was like, Kennedy doesn't have, what is a Musical.ly account? And Kennedy doesn't have a Musical.ly right. account. And she was like, yes, she does. And you have to look at it because you have to take something down. Oh, my goodness. Well, Kennedy did have a Musical.ly account. And she and her friends were making videos, dancing to songs. And one of the videos that Kennedy made, she did a cartwheel. And she had on a nightgown. And when she did the cartwheel, her undergarments were showing. Okay. And this is the thing that um, scared my friend's mom and then terrified us. Yes. So we had to figure out what her password was because one of her friends set the account up for her and showed her how to use it. So she didn't even know the password um, the, or anything. So we had to figure all these things out. And she was five years old at the time. Wow. And um, she didn't understand a lot. And I was caught off guard because the phone giving her access to the internet was an easy babysitter for me sometimes. If I was busy doing something, I could just give her an iPad or give her the phone or let her get on the computer. And I learned that day that I had to be more cautious about um, how much access I gave her and how I monitor the access that she has. And it was a difficult conversation, but we got through it. Uh, we've learned that um, so many parents were dealing with similar issues. Um, parents not thinking that their kids were accessing sites and giving out their personal information. So there was layers of conversations that happened as a result of that. And I think we're a little bit smarter now, yes. but you never know. Wow. So you said something really important, that it was an easy babysitter uh, for Kennedy. And so I think a lot of times it's, you know, you have games set. You know, I know parents have downloaded specific apps, and you're like, okay, go play. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it was equivalent to back in the day when yeah. you just go play outside. And you went to play outside, Yeah, yes. and, and now you're playing on a screen. Yeah. And so a big part of this conversation is if you're, if you're monitoring how much time your child is online and you're cutting back some of that time, then you as a parent have to be more present. You have to be and more so present. can you discuss, after those conversations, 
you know, what were the boundaries that were in place? You know, could Kennedy be online all night? You know, what happened at dinner? Can you talk about some of those things? Sure. Um, and I think it's a tough conversation for lots of families. Yeah. Um, on average, national t statistics indicate that um, teenagers are online nine hours a day. Wow. Um, which means kids, the age group we're talking about, about six hours a day. Wow. Um, the American Heart Association and some other, like the Mayo Clinic and some other um, health organizations recommend two hours a day. Screen wow. Time. And so immediately I want to implement that, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I want to jump in and, and say, yeah. you can only be online for two hours, yeah. and that includes the time she has to do research for school because Kennedy's in third grade now. It includes the time she wants to watch a movie or a clip on net yeah, Netflix. That's hard. Two hours. Um, but I found some really creative ways uh, how, of how to monitor that. So we have um, a document, a sheet of paper that has a lot of circles on it, and the circles represent, represent 15 minute time segments. Okay. So if she wants to play a game, she gets to scratch off the 15 minutes when she gets to the end of the 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. If she gets to the end of the circles, yeah. then that's the screen time for the day. Okay. So it makes her more accountable for um, how she uses the time. Yeah. And, and I think she uses it more wisely now. And it helps us to know that um, she's not spending more time online or, or more screen time than we would want her to have. Yes. So it, and it's tough to monitor because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when we're in the car, mm -hmm. if you choose to use that time, yeah. you have to be accountable for the time. When I'm busy, my husband's busy, when we're not available to play, <laughs> Kennedy is the only child, so yeah. sometimes we have to be involved in her play. It, it makes us more accountable, like you said, to be a part of what's happening. Um, I know that there's parents that are using this nationally, and it's mm -hmm. been helpful, a helpful tool to monitor. But then, of course, there's been moments where she's in her room reading a book, mm -hmm. and if we walk past the room, we see a light, and we know <laughs> <laughs> that underneath that blanket and that light <laughs> is a iPad or yeah. my phone or my husband's phone yeah. um, because Kennedy doesn't have her own cell phone but she does have an iPad and then we have to start the conversation all over and monitor yeah. and let her know that we're concerned because there are some consequences to too much screen time. Yes, and can you, can you talk about more of those consequences, some of the, the uh, obvious ones that we know are the predators, right? And so predators, um, a lot of times we think that we, we trust our children. We're like, our kids are good. They're not looking for bad things. And that's true, but bad things are looking for them. And so a lot of times they don't know if Kennedy is online, that this is a nine-year-old girl a lot of times. And so can you talk about more specifically uh, what are the psychological consequences? We know that the physical danger, we know also um, – Pornography, uh, students who are viewing pornography are becoming a lower and lower age, starting as small as 10 years old. And these are things that you cannot unsee once you have seen them, once you have been exposed to them. And so can you speak more about that, those psychological impacts? Sure. I'll start with that same news segment. Yeah. Um, there was another lady who had a 11-year-old daughter and her daughter was communicating with a grown man online, and he was posing as a 14-year-old boy. Wow. And they were making plans online to get together. Wow. And so uh, that calls, that calls for a completely different conversation, and that is, who are you communicating online, with online? Yeah. How do you know that that's actually the person that you're communicating with? So we had to talk about not sharing personal information. Yeah. Um, we had to talk about when you have a password, protecting the password. Mm -hmm. We had to talk about um, your dad and I have to know every site that you're going to. We have to see it before you go. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to look at some of the videos that you're looking at on YouTube yeah. because there's some kid-friendly videos on YouTube that are communicating some really inappropriate messages. So yes. we had to have 
layers and layers of conversations and we had to be more present mm -hmm. and we had to be more involved because like you said, there are some psychological effects mm -hmm. of being online. And what we've learned is that um, for babies, um, I know you, you've been at the grocery store, at the mall, and you've seen little babies with phones yeah. in their hands, iPads in their hand, and they're just swiping away. They can do some of the things that I can't even do with the phone. Yeah. And um, most of the national pediatric organizations recommend no screen time before the age of two. Wow. Um, because they're still in a developmental stage and there's a lot happening with their brain development. Yeah. There's a lot happening with their eye development. And some of the things that we've learned about screen time is that for those kids who, are, who have nine hours of screen time, six hours of screen time, the longer you look at a screen, it's impacting your, um, your psyche. Um, depression levels have been shown to be mm. extremely high for kids who mm. spend a lot of time online. Um, language has been impacted by kids who are spending too much time online. And then um, obesity has been shown to be significantly wow. higher for kids who spend a lot of time online. And there's a new study that indicates that the more screen time a child under two has, the higher their body mass index is. Wow. So we're in an epidemic of kids who are getting bigger and bigger over time. Um, one in three children are obese today. And a lot of that is a direct impact of, instead of being you know, in physical right, activities, yeah. mm -hmm. they're having fun on their phone mm -hmm. all day, every day. Mm -hmm. Another thing related to the depression that we're finding is that Kids are depressed because they're lonely mm -hmm. and they don't have real social interaction. Mm -hmm. And there are some developmental milestones that only happen through social interaction. And when you're not having that on a regular basis and you get into a place where you have to socially engage, mm -hmm. you might not have the skill set, which puts you even deeper into that state of depression. Wow. So we're concerned across the board about things that are happening as a result of too much screen time mm. and too much access to the internet. Wow, this is uh, so insightful. I didn't know you knew all these stats. <laughs> it's, so, it's so helpful. <laughs> it's so helpful. I also, I want to hear just about, as adults, this is, this is harmful for us yes. as well. Yeah. Uh, I even heard of some companies, they're having like an unplug day yeah. of once a month, just yeah. having an unplug day. So a lot of it, I think, it is clear that um, you or your husband have been intentional. Um, but I think that intentionality started as well with you as an adult. Of I can't be on the screen <laughs> all day. And so what are some things that you and your husband have done just to be present with each other um, to kind of combat the, okay, at dinner we on the phone. When we're in the car, we on the phone. <laughs> I'm glad you asked the question because I think it's a really important one. Um, being present is one of those things that we take for granted, I think, in our society today because we are, we're always multitasking and doing multiple things. And one thing that I know from the research is that parents could say things over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Mm. But the older their children get, the more they do what they see you do yes. versus do what you say. Yes. And I heard a parent just two weeks ago say, I had to start reading more books because I kept telling my children that they needed to read. And one of them said, well, you don't read, so why should I have to read? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you're going to be that involved mm -hmm. and that present, mm -hmm. then you have to model mm -hmm. what you want your children to see. Yeah. And, and so we had to not be as engaged with our phones. Yeah. Um, there was a time when Blackberries were the big thing. Yes. <laughs> and I remember I was in love with my Blackberry. Um, we have a main floor, our attic is finished, and then we have a basement. My Blackberry could be in the basement and I could be on the top floor and I would know when my Blackberry yeah. was vibrating. That's how in love I was with yes. it. And then one day I lost it and I was lost. Yes. I, I was lost. Somewhere along that 
phase where I lost my Blackberry, they became outdated and unpopular. Yeah. Which I think was one of the best things that ever happened to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I haven't liked the phone as much as I loved my Blackberry. <laughs> and I think I had my Blackberry when I was working at the church. <laughs> but um, if I say, Kennedy, you can only be on your phone for two hours a day. You can only be, you can only have so much screen time. Mm -hmm. Then I have to model not being so into my phone, into uh, watching TV, into things outside of us spending time together. Yeah. So one thing we've done, and we've had so much fun with this, yeah. is we read together. So if she's reading a book, um, we all read it together as a family. Wow. And we laugh because I tend to take on the role of the characters. And then my husband reads it in a certain way. And then sometimes we laugh at lo out loud because he'll take on the tone of certain characters, but he, he's cool, so he'll act like he's not doing it. <laughs> and I'll say, you just said that just like I said that. And it's a simple activity yeah. that has us laughing out loud. Yeah. Something that I would have never thought to do, just if she's reading a book, why don't we read a few chapters together? Yeah. We've had a lot of fun reading the chapters together. And I say it, I recommend it to families because it's simple. Mm -hmm. The kids can't say, I'm not gonna read because you don't read because now we're reading together yeah. and we're having a lot of fun with that. We also um, started playing more games together. Yeah. Monopoly, um, Kennedy has figured out how to win Monopoly on at least two occasions. <laughs> and I think the skill set that comes along with some of those things mm -hmm. are helpful. I, I think the way people play a game is how they play life. Mm -hmm. And so you get to see in a game if you have a, the kind of kid that cheats, that cuts corners, yeah. that <laughs> wants to rewrite the rules. Yeah. And then when those subjects come up in parent-teacher conferences and you hear the same things that's happening when you're playing the game, yes. you get to make those connections. And so I think playing more games, Monopoly, but not the way the kids play Monopoly now, because there's a lot of <laughs> layers of rules that I don't know about. Yeah. But, um, those interactions, you get to know your kid in a different way. You get to spend quality mm -hmm. time as a family without spending a truckload of money. Yes. Because we know going out or going to the movies costs a lot of money, but yeah. you already bought the book, so you might as well read it and have a good time with it. So we've been doing that a lot yes. more lately, and we call it our family time, and we have a good time with it. That's amazing. I love just the intentionality, being present, as you said. Mm -hmm. And if we're gonna have this conversation about how to encourage our children to be present, we have to be present ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so the playing the games, the reading book, all of that sounds so much fun. I know you're such a fun person. Yeah. So that's why I'm smiling. I'm like, I know Kennedy <laughs> is having a blast. Um, and those are just a few of the, of the things and you have to think about what works for your family. Um, I know one of the things that was so instrumental for me was my parents will always tell stories to me. And my father is a character. <laughs> and so he can tell a story and you would be like right there in the story. And so a lot of times we just, it sounds very basic, but we have to get back to human connection and human interaction. And um, that is a part of being a disciple of Christ is we're countercultural. And so while culture and the world is going technology, technology, you know, we're always on our phones, we have to be intentional about how to be present with each other. I think it was recorded, um, not recorded, it's research that out of the three years that Jesus spent with his disciples, an author said that he spent 49% of his time just being with his disciples. And I just thought that was an amazing uh, statistic because it just reminds me that relationship is yes. at the core of our faith. Yes. Uh, we can't do this isolated, we can't do it by ourselves. And so that's why this conversation is so important. I wanna thank uh, Dr. Groom so much for being here and the wealth of knowledge that she has. <laughs> uh, do you have any last words, any encouraging words you wanna give to a parent who, um, one of the things that has been lost in previous generations is we know 
um, growing up, I had to just respect for you as Dr. Groves. No. <laughs> and part of that is you're an adult, you're older than me, but that has been lost now in, in these coming generations. There's not a respect. And so some parents are struggling with that authority piece and, and they don't know how really to interact with yeah. their kids. And so could you speak um, any encouraging words you would have to them to keep on going? Sure. I think that the world we live in nowadays is tough. And uh, we have God, and we still have these everyday struggles. And I think that uh, life can be disappointing sometimes, and we take those disappointments home. And um, just the other day, um, Kennedy um, didn't do well on a test. And we pride ourselves on saying, we have our gifted baby, and <laughs> she gets straight A's. And right now, um, she's struggling. Third grade is hard. Yes. Um, but I have to take a step back and say, um, I cannot take out on her my disappointment for the expectation that I set. Mm. Mm -hmm. because I want to be in the circles with the other parents, with smart kids. Yeah, yeah. And I set that expectation. And I heard myself sound disappointed. Mm. And I had to roll back the tape and say, did you do your best? Mm -hmm. And she said, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think um, we're disappointed as parents with the trials of life. And sometimes we take it out on our kids and without even knowing it. Mm -hmm. um, they'll agitate us and mm -hmm. we'll take it out on them. And I think one way to bring parents and children back together is when you identify that you've done that, to mm -hmm. say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. To sit your kids down and say, yeah. I'm sorry about whatever the issue is. Yeah. And these are really tough conversations for parents. I had a student um, in one of my classes, and she had a 13-year-old son and a six-year-old son, and she loved her six-year-old. Mm. But the relationship with her 13-year-old, mm. she struggled in that relationship. Mm. And every week she would come to class with a question about it. This class happened to be family life, the past, present, and future of families. One that I designed and I love to teach because we get to talk about families over the decades. And she would always try to get free therapy. What do I need to do with this 13-year-old? What do I need to do with this 13-year-old? And then examples when she could talk about her six-year-old, she'd always take that in class. And I remember I would say, um, DePaul does not pay me to, <laughs> to provide therapy in class. And you know that was my out. But one day, we, was, we were probably in week seven of the class, and so this is seven weeks of her doing these comparisons between the six-year-old and the 13-year-old. And I remember saying to her, okay, I'm about to give it to you. I said, you need to sit the 13-year-old down and apologize to him wow. for liking the six-year-old better. Wow. Because we all know it, and if we all know it, yeah. and we only see you once a week, yeah. He knows it and he sees you every day. Wow. And she started to cry. I mean, and it was an outward cry that mm -hmm. I could tell that she knew it was true mm -hmm. and she wanted to correct it. And so the last four weeks of class, we got to hear about their relationship coming back together. Wow. Because she actually did it. Wow. She told him she was sorry for liking her brother, his brother, more than she liked him. And it all had to do with they had different dads and she had a strenuous relationship with the 13-year-old's dad mm -hmm. and she had a great relationship with the six-year-old's dad. And she had that tough conversation. And week 11, she brought the 13-year-old to class wow. because he wanted to see yes. the teacher who helped him have a better relationship with his mom. Wow. And those are tough conversations that parents have to have. Yeah. If you want that solid relationship with your children and yeah. you know you messed up or did something mm. wrong along the way, like I said with Kennedy, I put my expectation yeah. on her. Yeah. And she's doing the best she can. So I had to say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Did you do your best? Yeah. And she did her best and we had to celebrate 
the 69. She's going to kill me for saying the number on the tape. But we had to celebrate the 69 yes. because she had done her best. Yes. And so I, I think as parents, we have to stop and say, is there anything that I did mm. that is preventing us from having a great relationship right now? Yeah. And I guarantee you, if you really seek God in that space, mm. God will remind you, will bring to your remembrance those situations that you can go back, apologize, yeah. and move forward in your relationship with your children. Yeah, as you were talking, that's so powerful. That's so powerful. And I know we um, want to make this a shorter video, so <laughs> I'm not going to go any uh, rant. <laughs> but, <laughs> but as you were talking, Dr. Groves, I was just reminded that uh, a lot of times our phones, technology can be a defense mechanism for really dealing with relationships. And as you were talking about their pain in relationships, relationships take work. Yes. And so... Um, just back to this, the phrase of being present and, yeah. and loving your child enough to know that it's going to be uncomfortable to be present with you. Yes. I might like your little sister more than I like you yeah. and, and going through the hard work of that. So yeah. I love that. Um, in conclusion, this is our first episode of um, Crucial Conversations with Dr. Kenya Grooms. And she has done a phenomenal job and we're so blessed and to have you here. And I want to thank you so much. Thank you for um, Just some resources. The First resource is Children's Church. We are at 109th um, at Cottage Grove at the multi-purpose building. You can drop your child off as early as 9 a.m. And that uh, hour and a half is recreation and relationships uh, because we want to bring back human connection. And so if you drop your child off, uh, there could be a volunteer to help your child make a craft, to play with your son in basketball. Uh, we want to bring back those relationships. And then we have classes that are tailored for your child's age. We have have dynamic praise and worship and prayer. And so please drop your child off. That's 1030 a.m. on Sundays. Also, um, there are a lot of uh, resources online for parental security. Um, and so I didn't know this. A parent told me this last week that you could control your child's screen time on Android or iPhone. Um, and it's, it's free. It's in the settings. You can restrict so they can, like, be under their covers on Instagram, and then you just hit the little <laughs> and the app shut down. That's so cool to me. Kids, y'all probably mad that I shared this, but um, that's another resource. There's also an app called uh, Life360, and all of these are will be um, listed, um, but that controls um, if your child's battery is low and they're away from you, uh, if your child was driving. Or, it has so many different things that you can control, and all of the sites, I think a lot of this, too, is we don't know a lot of the social media sites now. So even I had to like research like what are sixth through eighth graders, fourth graders using because it's no longer Facebook or Instagram. But all of these social media sites have parental guides to kind of help inform you on that. And so that will be listed below as well. So uh, we've done enough talking, but thank you all so much for watching. Thank you.